Hey, this is David from the Earth Medicine Institute. We are here with Harriet Witt. Harriet is um, somewhat of a Maui legend. She's an astronomer, an astrologer, a visionary, a scientist, and, um, oh, I said astronomer, didn't I? Sorry, Harriet. Whatever, it's okay. An all-around <laughs> wonderful human being. So um, Harriet teaches experiential astronomy and other things. So welcome, Harriet. Hi, good morning. <laughs> So today we're going to go over um, Christmas with Einstein. Would you explain what that is? Uh, it's something I never attempted to do. <laughs> the only way I can explain how it came about would be to ask you to sort of imagine what it's like when you're walking on the beach. Uh -huh. Everybody had this experience. Okay. And so you're walking on the beach and you spot a beautiful little pebble or a beautiful shell. And so you pick it up and you put it in your pocket. And when you get home, you put it on your windowsill or your bookshelf or someplace. Okay. And then months later, years later, you're walking along the beach. You find another beautiful pebble. Pick it up, put it in your pocket. You know. And eventually you have quite a collection of nice pebbles on your windowsill. Well, that's what happened to me. I just found some fascinating little tidbits <laughs> that had to do with um, the star at the top of the Christmas tree. Uh, and that's all I had was these little tidbits that I came across, I think through Joseph Campbell, but I wasn't keeping track of the source at the time because I didn't know that it was going to lead me to anything bigger. Um, so I had these little juicy tidbits about the star at the top of the Christmas tree and that the original Christmas tree was a pattern in the sky that predated Christ by many millennia. And that's all I had. And I started sharing it with my students at MCC, my astronomy students. Uh, one of my students was Helen Kritzler. Some of you may know Helen Kritzler. Hi, yeah. Helen. Yeah. Helen's mother is a Velikovsky, and her uncle was Emmanuel Velikovsky. Who really? Was, yes. That's, you're kidding yeah. me. Her, 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 yeah, so Helen's great uncle is, is uh, Emmanuel Velikovsky. And Helen has a Velikovsky mind, if you know Helen, yeah? <laughs> oh. And so she was one of my students at MCC. And... Um, when I shared with my students the material about the, about the original Christmas tree as a pattern you can see in the night sky, and I showed them the pattern, Helen started asking me very deep questions that made me realize, oh, there's more here. I hadn't thought about the fact that there's more here. <laughs> and as a result of Helen's questions, I started thinking about it more deeply and looking more deeply. And then, lo and behold, this newfangled thing called Google happened. <laughs> Because we're, we're talking 1996, 1997, okay, before there was a Google. That's when Helen was in my classes, okay. Uh, but then Google came along, and Helen was really good at Googling. So she found all this fascinating stuff about the uh, quote-unquote Christmas tree in the sky and the shamans who, who traveled up the axis of the tree or the trunk of the tree. And she started sending me this material. So it's really because of Helen that I have this material. It's not that I knew it was there and went looking for it. I didn't know it was there. Oh, that's fantastic. It's connecting dots, right? Which yes. is the same way we, we create the constellations in our mind. They're ah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. No, I love it. I, I just realized when you said that, I could say that I've spent my whole life just connecting dots. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, okay. so, um, anyway, let me, let me, I'm just going to show this and we will, we will wing it. So I'm going to share a screen. My Christmas with Einstein, a tale of indigenous relativity. Part one. This is Harriet Witt. We begin with the star that's at the top of what we've come to think of as the Christmas tree. This is called the world tree and it inspired an indigenous practice that became the Christmas tree. You can see this counterclockwise motion of stars over the course of hours as our planet spins us around her, our axis. Ancient reindeer people revered the world tree because it shows us the cosmic order in our everyday lives. Reindeer people don't lead the reindeer, but follow them. This is because Reindeer figured out how to survive here long before humans arrived. Our first roads were footpaths 
and our first footpaths were animal tracks. As we followed these tracks to watering holes and food sources, we learned to survive where humans had never gone. Reindeer are revered by people who have been guided by them. People look to them as guardians and as spirit animals. Animals have always been our teachers because they figured out how to thrive here long before we appeared. We've looked to animals as our genomic ancestors, imitating their movements and working to gain their instincts and capabilities. Some people have learned to whisper with animals. Some ancient animal whispers communicated so effectively that other folks perceived them to transform into the animal. People who transformed into an animal were called shapeshifters and shamans. Reindeer shamans helped Arctic people to expand their awareness and therefore their chance of survival. Some reindeer shamans were idolized, made into icon, idols. Reindeer shamans were also sky watchers. Notice the stars depicted at the top of this shaman's drum skin. Reindeer shamans meditated on the world tree as they did their drumming. Skywatching reindeer shamans were celebrated for their gift of raising people's awareness. They became the inspiration and the role models for our Santa Claus legends. When Santa was a shaman, the ancient origins of Santa Claus and the Christmas tree. But what does Christmas have to do with skywatching reindeer shamans? To answer this, we remember our winter solstice. At day's end on the winter solstice, the sun glows like a flame atop this stone circle. The winter solstice is pivotal because shortening days are behind us and lengthening days are ahead. This is the end of a half year cycle, but it's not yet the start of the next. In other words, the old cycle is no longer affecting us and the new cycle has yet to imprint on us. This in-between point is a time out of time. This time out of time is called a null point, shown by these red dots. A null point is a transition, so it's where we can effectively introduce change. Trying to change when a cycle is already in full swing is as hard as swimming upstream. New Year's resolutions are rooted in our indigenous knowledge of no points. Our New Year is not at the winter solstice anymore because of calendar reforms. This null point gives us an opportunity to renew and recalibrate our relationship with nature and with our own nature. If we want to make the most of this opportunity, we can follow the example of sustainable cultures who used the null point for introducing changes necessary to stay alive. Different cultures have developed different practices for utilizing the null point because different ecosystems offer different resources and challenges. The Arctic resources and challenges have motivated its reindeer people to find reindeer shamanic ways of utilizing the winter solstice. Remnants of these ways are still with us in the form of puzzle pieces. We can assemble the eco puzzle. We can see how to live on our planet sustainably if we remember that reindeer offer milk, meat, hides, transportation, childcare, and, as we'll soon see, much more. The sky over the North Pole is another piece of our eco-puzzle. This world tree is a survival guide for the folks of the far north. Night in the Arctic lasts 24-7 for weeks around December 21st. 
day in the Arctic lasts 24-7 for weeks around June 21st. But why these extremes? To see why, we remember that billions of years ago, our planet got slammed by an object half her size. This tilted our daily spin axis. We're tilted at a 23 and a half degree angle to the plane of our yearly orbit around the sun. Note the solstices here. Our tilt is the reason for seasons. In winter, our hemisphere is tilted away from the sun. In summer, our hemisphere is tilted toward the sun. You see this world tree in the Arctic sky 24 seven for weeks around December 21st, unless it's cloudy. The stars appear to circle around counterclockwise because we're viewing them from a planet that's spinning us around her, our axis every 24 hours. This circling of the stars is apparent. The actual motion is ours. The movement we see in the sky is the projection of our spinning. This is the apparent sky motion over our equator, for contrast. The world tree is a pivotal piece of our indigenous eco-puzzle. Notice the star at the still point of this motion. It's the only star in the sky that's located over the north end of our daily spin axis. This still point star is called the North Star the pole star, or Polaris. The closer you are to the North Pole, the higher you see the North Star. So the better your view of the world tree. The still point star is called the nail of the sky in Siberia. And it was pivotal to the success of shamans in working with the winter solstice null point. The world tree was so valuable to people that during the winter solstice, they went into the forest in search of a tree shaped like the world tree. Bringing it indoors, they decorated their forest tree as an altar to the world tree. The star atop our altar to the world tree is still at the top, but today we call it the Christmas tree. Hmm. How did its name get changed? How our altars to the world tree came to be called Christmas trees is another piece of our eco puzzle. If we want to assemble this puzzle, we need to remember that at the winter solstice, shortening days are behind us and lengthening days are ahead. We also need to remember that our sun's light becomes our Earth's life, thanks to photosynthesis. Primal people so revered this miracle that they celebrate the return of the light at the winter solstice. How light becomes life is a mystery to science. Of course, mysteries can be solved and mysteries can be celebrated. So let's look at the celebration of the winter solstice where Jesus Christ was born. Jesus was born in the Roman Empire where the winter solstice was celebrated as Sol Invictus, sun that cannot be conquered. The Bible has no record of Christ's birth date, but December 25th was always Sol Invictus. Deo is the root of our words deity and divine. Soul is divine because, thanks to photosynthesis, its light becomes our life. There is no historical record of anyone celebrating Christ's birth until the fourth century after Christ. During the fourth century, the Roman emperor, Constantine, weaponized Christianity. 
Constantine was not Christian because in those days, Christians were slaves, disenfranchised people, and counterculture folks who drew their strength from Christ's message of love. Constantine worshipped soul. He built the city of Constantinople as a monument to himself. He financed this by imposing fines on everyone who didn't go along with his program. His program, by his account, came to him in a vision. He claimed he saw a cross superimposed on the sun as he heard these words, By this sign shall you conquer. The holiday of Sol Invictus was rebranded as Christmas at Constantine's behest in the year 325. Twelve years later, he was baptized into Christianity on his deathbed. Constantine, by this sign, conquer. The Roman Catholic Church that Constantine weaponized went on to control the thrones of Europe. This cathedral is in England. As you know, the so-called Christmas tree began in the sky, where the stars appear to circle the north polar end of our planet's axis, because we're viewing them from a planet that's spinning us around her, our axis, every 24 hours. The movement we see in the sky is the projection of our spinning. Our world tree has been honored in different ways by different cultures. The trunk of the world tree is our planet's daily spin axis. The axis mundi is Latin for our daily spin axis. Mundi means the world, and it gave us our word mundane. The axis mundi is widely revered as the connection between the heavenly and the mundane. The axis mundi is how we connect our mundane lives to the heavens. As you know, the axis mundi is most available to us at the sacred null point of our winter solstice. This is the end of part one. Please see part two. This is Harriet at PassengerPlanet.com. My Christmas with Einstein, a tale of indigenous relativity. Part two. This is Harriet Witt. Gift-giving at the winter solstice is practiced in many cultures, but where does this fit into our eco-puzzle? Joseph Campbell helps us here. His historical atlas of world mythology depicts far northern shamans as the archetypal gift-givers we have come to know as Santa Claus. These shamans are from... Scandinavia, Siberia, and Lapland. Shamanic Santa has a gift for us, and it's the shaman's giftedness. The shaman is gifted at using the meditative power of drumming to alter brainwave patterns and transcend mundane life. This generates community cohesion for decisions that need to be made at the winter solstice null point. Note the reindeer antlers on the shaman and the world tree on the drum. Yes, the reindeer shaman is gifted at seeing in a season of darkness by achieving inner stillness. The shaman becomes still by meditating on the still point star atop the world tree. This tree, this axis mundi, is made apparent to us by our planet spinning us around her axis every 24 hours. Yes, the shaman aligns with our planet's axis. If you align with our planet's axis, you ascend or climb 
the world tree, up into the heavens. Notice the up arrow at the top of the shaman's spine. Shamanic Santa is said to live at the North Pole. Only when you're at the North Pole does the Earth's axis come up through the soles of your feet, through your legs, through your spine, and out the crown of your head. So when you're at the North Pole, you're naturally aligned with our axis and can climb up the world tree. From up in the sky, you look down and see that what's moving is our earth and not the sky. The ability to do this and to see this is the gift, the giftedness of shamanic Santa. Shamanic Santa's beloved world tree is called Yggdrasil in Old Norse. Because Yggdrasil joins the mundane and the cosmic, it's the key to northern cosmologies. Yggdrasil. Yggdrasil. Yggdrasil still has deep meaning in today's Scandinavia. Many cultures revere our axis mundi because it joins our mundane lives with the cosmos. We do well to revisit the shamans who inspired our Santa Claus legends if we want to make the most of the opportunity that is the winter solstice null point. One of these shamans is Odin the Allfather. This Scandinavian hero became the Allfather when he surrendered to the world tree, uniting the mundane and the cosmic. Notice what his index finger is tracing on the ground here. Odin is gifted with a vision of the runes during his surrender to Yggdrasil. The runes. The runes, like the I Ching, help us to see the cosmic patterns in our mundane lives. The gift of shamanic vision also comes to us from the reindeer people. One of their teaching parables is about the northern sky. In the northern sky, we see this, the Big Dipper constellation, near the North Star, near the Still Point Star. We see the Dipper appearing to circle around the Still Point Star every 24 hours as our planet spins us around her axis. The dipper's motion is apparent. The actual motion is ours. The Big Dipper is one of many names for this constellation. It's also called Odin's Chariot because it's a vehicle for Odin's shamanic journeys. Since Odin is among the role models for the figure we call Santa, Odin's chariot became Santa's sleigh. If you are Santa sitting in your Big Dipper sleigh, you gaze down onto planet Earth and you see her spinning around her axis every 24 hours. As you watch this, you beam down your shamanic gift, and in 24 hours, it reaches everyone on Earth. If we want to see how Santa manages to deliver his gift inside people's houses, we need to remember that Santa's stories were also inspired by the shamans of Lapland, where homes have a smoke hole chimney at the top. As winter snow piles up high, the only way to enter is through the chimney. As shamanic Santa legends spread to Europe and America, Santa's clothing changed, but the entry method stayed the same. Note the two arrows here. The shaman's drum is always among the gifts. 
This is how Santa passes on to future generations his gift of shamanic drumming. A little shaman-to-be sees the drum and his genes recognize its primal power. The Little Drummer Boy Now that we have assembled this much of our eco-puzzle, we are faced with a question. How can we bring eco-meaning to our personal holiday celebrations? We can bring eco-meaning to our holiday celebrations if we look again at the reindeer shaman. This photo is from the Siberian Times in 2009. Notice the staffs held by the shamanic Santas, how each staff is a stylized world tree. Also notice the man in the center's stylized reindeer antlers. This caption from the Siberian Times reads, As well as presenting gifts to children, he spreads positive energy and brings midwinter happiness. Picture from the governor of Yanao. Siberians remember that Santa was never just a fantasy for little kids. In Scandinavia, the reindeer shaman is still revered today. Scandinavia, like Siberia, is far from Europe, where shamanic reverence for nature was wiped out by the Roman Catholic Church's Inquisition. These contemporary photos make us wonder, how was the inwardly gifted reindeer shaman transformed into a bringer of nothing but material holiday gifts? This transformation is rooted in the story of the Reverend Clement Clark Moore, 1779 to 1863. The Reverend taught literature and divinity at General Theological Seminary in New York City. He wrote the Santa story that we know best, was the night before Christmas when all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. He did not write this story for publication, but for his family. He stored it in his desk. Later, a house sitter found it and published it without his permission. Keep in mind that this happened in the anything goes if you can get away with it mentality of New York City in the 1800s. Reverend Moore's poem inspired artists many of them commercial, and Santa devolved into a mere marketing tool. When Santa was a reindeer-whispering shaman, we understood the connection between the world tree and the reindeer. In this image, notice the shaman's drum depicting the world tree and the reindeer flying upward. Reindeer are ascending Yggdrasil, the world tree. Reindeer with Yggdrasil, the world tree. Reindeer with Yggdrasil, the world tree. What does the reindeer shaman know about this animal? The reindeer shaman knows that these animals learned how to survive brutal winters because they follow their teachers, who are much more ancient. The reindeer's teachers dwell in the ground. More than a billion years ago, beings like these assisted ocean plants in their epic migration out of the water and up onto land. Fungi assisted these plants by mediating relationships between them and the soil. These fungal relationships are still supporting plants as an underground internet. Yes, fungi are the genomic ancestors of all animal life, including humans.
our fungal ancestors live on in our DNA. Because our fungal ancestors live on in our DNA, many of our most effective medicines, such as penicillin, are fungi. Shamans notice that after reindeer nibble on the Amanita muscaria fungus, they dance, they prance, and they fly as in high. Flying reindeer depicted on the shaman's drum are ascending the world tree. The shaman with flying reindeer is still celebrated today in far northern cultures. In this painting, you can see the red Amanita muscaria mushrooms growing on the ground and behind the painting to the left. This raises a question. How does the shaman join the flying reindeer? The shaman observes that this mushroom can be toxic to humans, but the reindeer's digestion metabolizes the toxins, allowing the shaman to fly with the reindeer by drinking its non-toxic urine. Contemporary far northern people still honor their shamans for what they have learned from our fungal ancestors. The common name for Amanita muscaria is fly agaric mushroom. A contemporary Siberian shaman still wears the red and white polka dots of the mushroom with whom she journeys. Cultural appropriation has happened. This photo of Earth with the moon in the foreground was taken by an astronaut on Christmas Eve, 1968. It's the first photo of Earth as the sacred being that indigenous people have always known her to be. Thanks to NASA, the industrial world is starting to remember indigenous reverence. Kids are growing up seeing with their own eyes that our Earth deserves to be treated like the heavenly being that she actually is. I call this story My Christmas with Einstein because Einstein understood the relativity of time and that relativity is about us having a relationship with this movement that we've been conditioned to call time. Yes, Einstein had such clear vision that he saw clear through the unnatural, rigid, mechanistic assumption that time is absolute, that time is independent of us, relentlessly pressing us forward with you and me as its hapless, helpless victims. Einstein, seeing clear through the mechanistic illusion, opened the way for us to have a relationship with our years and a relationship with the cycle of our seasons. Just as our planet's indigenous people have always had a relationship with the cycle of our seasons. Yes, indigenous relativity is what I'm celebrating here. I'm grateful to Helen Kritzler for midwifing this project, to Elizabeth Theriot for her drumming wisdom, and to the artists and photographers whose work is used here. I created and presented this free of charge in December 2019 as my gift to the Makawao Public Library for their decades of loving service. For this reason, and because I lacked the means, I didn't always credit the artists and photographers whose work definitely does deserve credit. I share what I've done in the gifting spirit of the original Aboriginal Santa.
This is Harriet Witt, Harriet at PassengerPlanet.com. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> anyway, again, I'm going to, um, I'm going to, when I, um, when I um, put this together for um, as one unit, there won't be all the interruptions. So thank you all very much. Um, yes, this will be available. Um, anybody have any questions for Harriet? I've got a bunch of ideas, but Harriet, any, anybody have any questions for Harriet? Okay. <laughs> Hi, Mark. <laughs> um, so Harriet and I just this morning were going over, um, we were kind of tying this into Taoist thought. Harriet, do you want to share some of what we were talking about? Yeah, we were talking about the fact that in Taoism, the North Star plays a really, really important role in their shamanic practices, which to me is another example of what I'm choosing to call indigenous relativity. I don't think relativity is anything new. It's about the fact that you can have a relationship with this, what seems to be the movement of the sky, <laughs> but is actually the movement of the earth through space. And that's what we call time. We've been conditioned to think that a year is a unit of time and to think that years come and go, but years don't actually come and go. We orbit through them. <laughs> You know, <laughs> um, so, so you think that the our our um, we've been conditioned um, in a way that's misleading or that takes us away from something that's important. Yes, we've been conditioned to disconnect. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. When you think if you're if you're going through life assuming that years come and go rather than knowing that no we orbit through them. <laughs> then you don't have much of a relationship with the experience. <laughs> Interesting, yeah, yeah. That's and I think that's part of the Industrial Revolution. I mean, the Industrial Revolution was designed to make us into dutiful little consumer cogs in the great wheels of industry. Well, people aren't going to consume and consume, consume and consume and consume unless there's a void in their life. I think the void is the disconnect from nature. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's well, that's one of the things we're doing at the Earth Medicine Institute is trying to reconnect. It's actually it's not even it's a reclamation of who we are at yes. our source. Reclamation of remembering. Right, right, right. Of remembering, yeah, of rejoining. Yeah. Awesome. Right. Cool. Yeah, we were um we were uh, Harry and I were going over the Taoism and the the idea of um in many of the Taoist swords, um the Taoist images and swords and stars there they're like the Taoist swords have um cassiopeia on one side and the um the dipper on the other and they that they rotate around the north star and the north star being a fixed place of the Tao or a fixed place of almost like an infinity point isn't that what they call um isn't it called the infinity point those points you were talking about i'm not aware of it i think of it as a kind of an anchor um, oh, like the nail in the sky. Yeah, like a cycle, you know, you can count on it, you can depend on it, and it marks the Earth's axis. So my sense is that what shamans were doing was aligning with the Earth's axis. If you're aligned with the Earth's axis, you're centered. Because, mm -hmm. because the axis is the still point that the whole Earth is revolving around, or rotating around, excuse me. Um, so if we can align ourselves with that, uh, wow. <laughs> It makes me wonder if there isn't a magnetic component to that, because, you know, heart math and all this stuff. And, and I believe, isn't um, birds navigate through electromagnetism, correct? Yeah, but there's a difference between magnetic north and geographic north. The magnetic fields wander a little. They wander. <laughs> wow. uh, geographic no north is the point around which our planet is spinning. The, even now, if you, you Google it, you can look at maps, you can see that magnetic north is not at the geographic pole. It's mm. somewhere in Canada and it kind of wanders around. <laughs> right, right. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, uh, this, is, I, this is fascinating stuff. I love the way you've connected the dots and, and made this um, 
almost palpable. Harriet teaches what we call experiential astronomy. So it, it's something that um, normally we think of as astronomy as math and rocks, you know, bouncing around in the cosmos, but... Um, Cosmic billiard balls. <laughs> billiard balls, exactly. Newtonian billiard balls. But um, Harriet has taken the, these ideas and made them somatic and Einsteinian. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. I've done it with your help. <laughs> um, you know, when you created Earth Medicine Academy or Earth Medicine Institute, whatever it was called years ago, and, uh, and you asked me to be one of your instructors, the students who came to those classes asked questions, kind of like what Helen Kritzler did. They uh -huh. asked much deeper question, questions than you know, most folks do. Um, and that really helped me to, as you say, embody astronomy um, right. because it's not about stuff that's out there <laughs> it's not even about math you know? <laughs> it's oh. like, well it is about math but not not exclusively it's about yeah. who we are in the cosmos yes it's about patterns and anybody can see patterns you don't need math to see patterns yeah we're I'm pattern seeking creatures yeah. yes we're pattern seeing creatures and i think math developed from the fact that pattern seeking creatures. Exactly, yeah. Harriet will be teaching a class for us um, sometime in the next 12 months called um, The Intimate Sky, correct? Yes. Yes. And I'm really excited about that. So this will be an opportunity for us to um, for us to experience this through Zoom and through the internet. Um, Harriet's um, really inimitable teaching style and ways of describing um, ways of experiencing our planet, which unlike anything I've ever come across. So I'm really excited about that. Me too. <laughs> it's just, I was taking a lot longer to do than I thought it would. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. It's okay. We got plenty of time. Uh, Judy Epstein said, I so appreciate this and would love to spread its message and transformative perspective. I hope the format allows an easy sharing on multiple platforms, blessing and gifts. Yes, we'll be. I'm going to uh, put this together, produce it, re-record it, and then we will we will offer it um, for free on our on my YouTube channel, EarthMedicineInstitute.com, and uh, or Earth Medicine Institute, and on Facebook and Instagram. So, cool. Any other questions? Um, oh, Vanessa says we are next to the 21st of December. Please, Harriet, could you please articulate a little bit about what this day represents? Mahalo. It's from Vanessa DeLuca. So the, the winter solstice then is, it's a time out of time. It's, a, it's, a, it's an opportunity to start fresh. It's difficult to introduce change when a cycle is already in full swing, but we can introduce change uh, during this time out of time moment. Um, so it's an exciting time. Um, it used to be that people got together to introduce whatever change they felt they needed to make. Uh, and um, I hope that we <laughs> can do the same with this coming winter solstice. Absolutely, yeah, it's a, it's a good time to do that. Um, Samana asked, she or said she's interested in Saturn and Jupiter. Oh, well, you can see them coming together. Have you been watching them coming together in the evening sky? Aren't they beautiful? Yeah, oh. yeah. Uh, it's, it's so nice to, yeah. Any comments on the dynamic of those coming so close? Uh, it happens every now and then. I mean, it's not the first time, it, but a lot of people are easily able to see it now. I can't think of anything quickly that I can say about it. Um, it's not that easy to <laughs> describe quickly. Yeah. Well, it's definitely, it's definitely the, I mean, Saturn and Jupiter um, traditionally embody opposites. Saturn is contracting and, and structured mm -hmm. and Jupiter yeah. is expansive and unstructured. So yes. It, that's definitely a null point in, in my reality, I tell you right now, politically and, and, uh, <laughs> and socially, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah Saturn is the ability to be, uh, it, Saturn is our capacity for calcification, crystallization, petrification, concentration, gravitation, saturation. The word saturation actually comes from Saturn. Um, and uh, so, um, it's our ability to crystallize a foundation of wisdom from our life experiences. Um, sometimes we don't crystallize a foundation of wisdom. Sometimes we crystallize a chip on our shoulder. Yeah. 
um, <laughs> and in which case the heaviness of the Saturn doesn't feel constructive, it feels obstructive, it feels like a burden. But if we have crystallized with a foundation of wisdom, then with the Jupiter energy, we can reach out from that foundation. Jupiter is the ability to open up, reach out. Jupiter is centrifugal motion, Saturn is centripetal motion. Yeah. Yeah. So if there's a foundation there, then we can stand on that foundation and reach out um, farther than we could if we were not standing on a foundation. Yes. And also, isn't that, isn't the um, spagyrics, you know, the alchemists would take the plants and they would, they would turn it into crystals. They would burn it and take, take the ash and then put it back into the medicine. I don't know if you're uh, familiar with that. But that's only an, vaguely. I'd love to know more. It's an alchemical process. Well, I'm hoping actually that next, um, next month we will have um, Brian Leto here. He's a, one of our instructors. He's an alchemist and a, and a plant chemist. So um, maybe, oh. maybe he can, uh, you know, Brian, don't you? Harriet? No, the name sounds familiar, but I'm not good with names either. I mean, I might know the guy and because I'm so bad with remembering names. <laughs> anyway, yeah, stay tuned. He's an alchemist and Brian's, um, well, I'm gonna, I was going to say a genius, but I think it would embarrass him if I said that. So he's quite bright. So anyway. Um, I look forward to that. Because, you know, astrologically, every planet is associated with certain plants. Um, yeah, exactly. So there's something there. <laughs> it's just a matter of how to interpret it. And the old, the original, mid, you know, um, from the Middle Ages, the alchemical plant medicine, they would do these extractions, aligning the plants with the, the patterns in the sky, their, their yeah. procedures with patterns in the sky, but then they would also take the essence of the plant. They would, after they had extracted all the, the mana from the plant, they would take the essence and they would burn the plant and take the core minerals and put it back into the medicine. And it's almost like bringing saturn back into jupiter so That's fascinating fascinating you know it reminds me of something in samana i think you and i used to talk about this back in the early mid 90s <laughs> on baldwin beach you mean <laughs> Where on we? our walks on the beach <laughs> the connection between cosmos and cosmetology mm. yeah yes yeah that's <laughs> if right go, if you go way way back to the people that david's just talking about um People understood that the cycles of time are things that we can align ourselves with. And if we don't align ourselves with the cycles of time, we probably just go extinct. <laughs> you know? And uh, so to align yourself with the cycles of time, you, uh, one of the things you can do is you can work with plants, the way David was just describing. Yeah? And, um, and not just plants, but th there are clays, that you can work with and substances in the soil, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, minerals. Anyway, um, so long, long time ago, people developed a, a method of working with plants and clays and other minerals in the soil and applying them to their bodies um, to come into alignment with the cycles of nature. And mm -hmm. this was called cosmetology. It wasn't about makeup, it wasn't about looking pretty, it was about aligning with the cycles of nature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Somewhere along the line, as we disconnected and superficialized and materialized, cosmetology just came to be about putting makeup on your face. <laughs> but it was originally about aligning with the cosmos. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. Yeah. So Samana and I were working on that a lot, you know, back, back before Google, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've taught many, many students that, Harriet, your words of wisdom I've shared with them. You helped me to understand it. <laughs> No, I, did, I just have this abstract astronomical knowledge. I don't know that much about clays and ointments and plants and yeah, but through you, I begin, oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> Connecting those dots, that's wonderful. Um, Paul Garrett, Paul Hugel says uh, here, I've always been intrigued by as, as how the Siberian ancestors found the Amanita muscaria so sacred. Found under the birch tree and in cases so rare to find one prepare in a unique way by heating, by heating, converting to the ibotenic acid, to muscimol and muscarine, the psychedelic component. Ceremonial participants fasted prior and one mushroom would be consumed. Then the urine of that individual would be collected. Since the native ingredient passed through the body urine via one mushroom's active ingredient could be shared by many individuals in a shamanic ceremony. Fascinating. That's true. 
That's true. Thank I don't, you. Know, I, I don't, I don't know. know much about the mushrooms. Thank you. There's a lot there, though. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know about if it would FDA it would pass FDA muster on um, drinking urine, <laughs> psychedelic urine, but it's an interesting thing. And and there's a kind of you know, as always, there's a kind of genius to um, not kind of genius. There is a genius to indigenous knowledge that we completely misunderstand and overlook. You know, yes. the spirit yeah. is so vast and human culture is so multifaceted and we, we see everything through these little tiny peepholes of science and logic and there's so much more to being human than than algorithms and um, yeah, and syllogisms. So peepholes, yeah. You know, one of the things that motivated me to put this material together was uh, you may remember about ten years ago NPR featured something about uh, mushrooms and, you know, the, the old shamans in Santa Claus. But they depicted the, Santa, the old Santa Claus or the old shamans, they depicted them as drug pushers. <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, no, you know, just... Yeah, yeah, not, yeah, yeah. Right. You know, disgusting old drug pushers. And it was just so irreverent that I thought, oh, I've got to, I know more, I know there's more to the picture than that. You know, and that kind of motivated me to put together this program for the Makoa Library last year. Yeah, that, yeah. Um, Samana says, how long of a period of time, how long is the null point? Time out of time. <laughs> it's like how many, how many angels can dance on a pin, you know? Yeah, I don't, I don't really know what to say there. I can tell you that if you watch, so you don't need a calendar to know when the solstice is happening. If you just pay attention to the point of sunrise or the point of sunset, uh, you know, the sun does, uh, sets in the east, but it doesn't always set exactly due east. The only time the sun sets exactly due east is at the spring and fall equinoxes. A sunrise. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, so it's just that day of the solstice. It's not oh, a period of time. About five days. If you're watching the point of sunrise, you see it's been creeping farther and farther south. Yeah. And, and if you're really watching carefully, and you have to mark it somehow, you know, with a stick or a rock. But uh, and stand in the same spot yourself. You'll see uh, around December 21st, there's a period of about five days there where the point of sunrise doesn't shift. Um, and that's what's called the solstice. St the word solstice means sun standing still. What's standing still is the point of sunrise, not the sun itself, um, but the point uh, where you see the sunrise, that, that's standing still. This is related to the word stationary. Uh, I love that. It's the same thing with the sunset. So you can watch it yourself and, and really get an answer to your question from your own experience. I don't have an unobstructed eastern horizon personally, and I don't have an unobstructed western horizon either. <laughs> but if you're out in the desert. <laughs> uh, Harriet, um, Her um, Helen Critzo just signed on. Maybe you could, um, she, so she's on now. Maybe you could have a, say a few words to her. Oh, I was just been singing your praises, Helen. <laughs> uh, I can't hear you, Helen. Or is she? Oh, I think she's probably muted. I Helen, you, you want to unmute? Yeah, there I am. There hey, you are. Helen. <laughs> Somehow I didn't get your invitation. It just came through Jasmine, and I was like late, so. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. No, I was telling everybody that this um, program, this story, um, really just started with one little fact that I stumbled across, I don't even remember, maybe in the 1980s, which was that the star at the top of the Christmas tree is the North Star, and the original Christmas tree predates Christ by millennia. It's a pattern in the sky. And that's all I had. And I shared it with my astronomy students, and you were in my class, and you started asking me very deep questions about it that made me go deeper. I didn't know there was anything deeper there. <laughs> <laughs> but you insisted that we go deeper. You knew there was more. You knew there was more, and I didn't. Uh, and so, as I said earlier, Helen just kept asking really smart questions, and the other students joined in. And then uh, somewhere around 1998, Helen discovered there's this newfangled thing called Google. <laughs> and she started Googling and finding out all the other stuff beyond, you know, the North Star. <laughs> So uh, this is really Helen's story. <laughs> I just got it started. All right. Thank you so much. Well, we are coming up on the hour. Um, are there any final questions for Harriet? If you have questions, just email me. I respond to emails, not always the same day. <laughs> awesome. 
Awesome. Harriet, this has been wonderful. It's great to see everybody and, and thank you so much for, for joining us, everybody. Next month, we are shooting for Brian Leto, plant chemist and alchemist, to join us on our Call of the Wild. So take care. Beautiful. Happy holidays. Aloha. Happy holidays. <laughs>